Academy Training Series. Uh, glad that you could join us today, whether you're online or here in the classroom with us. And uh, today will be myself, Stacy Ginn, and I also have my partner, Kelly Tony, with RE Titans. And uh, what we're going to be covering today are tips and tricks to estimating rehab. So something that uh, we get asked about quite frequently and uh, look forward to discussing this and uh, giving you guys some good information that you can utilize on your own and, and out in the field. Um, one of the things I think that, uh, that we run into is that um, you know, there's a lot of deals that come across our desk. Uh, a lot of times you will uh, see things and I know that one of the key factors is being able to react quickly and something that will happen is, is we'll be sent by uh, one of our students a deal and we look at it real quickly and it's like no that that's just not going to work and so uh, a lot of times it's like well how did you figure that out so quick well there's some simple things we can do to do that to really get in the ballpark of where a rehab is going to fall and not have to spend a tremendous amount of time doing that. And a lot of times if they share pictures, we don't even have to go out on site. I mean, you can just look at the pictures and say, you know what, based on some, uh, some, you know, key factors, based on some things we're seeing, you know, their, their estimates are way off or their estimates are good. And hey, this is something we should go uh, check out. And um, it kind of ties into, you know, comps and the rehab going back to your price or kind of your three components that you look at whether you're buying a property for rental or for flip or whatever you're going to do with it so uh, here to get started uh, go over our disclaimer we have here and um, understanding that uh, this presentation is for educational purposes only and that uh, during the course of this we're not uh, providing or practicing accountancy or performing accounting services we're not uh, doing anything that constitutes the practice of law uh, we're not providing as part of this webinar uh, licensed real estate services or giving tax economic or investment advice. But what we do do is offer our opinions and advice from time to time based on our past professional experience and that's what we'll be doing for you guys today. So let's just get started. How do we estimate a rehab on the fly? And first thing we want to do is start with the basics. I mean, we just we just start out and we look at the basics. And so, what are those? Well, first of all, what is the square footage of the property? You know that that is a key component of estimating a rehab. Is you know what's the square foot? Because obviously, if you have something that's a small square footage, it's going to take less time, less materials, less labor. And if something's got a larger square footage, uh, certainly goes the other way. Uh, the next thing is we look at the general condition of the property. Uh, we'll get into here in just a second how that factors in, but you know, a property that needs what we call kind of just refer to as paint and carpet versus a property that needs significant repairs, obviously we're going to use different factors in that. Next thing we want to do is look at the age of the property, kind of like anything else. Um, when you have something that is a newer build and has been built to newer construction standards, uh, that property inherently, a lot of times, it's not going to cost as much to rehab. Uh, a lot of times, though, we're looking at properties that can be 30, 40, 50 years old, um, especially on the flip side of things. And so, uh, you know, we're going to want to look a, more, a little more intensively into that. Um, if we're looking at rentals, a lot of times those properties might only be 10 to 15 years old and we want to take that into account. There are some key dates that we look out there in regards to certain things and we'll get into the details. Uh, one is lead paint and um, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong, but 1978 is the date for lead paint. Yeah, Kelly just confirmed that. So uh, 1978 is a key date that we look at when we look at the age of properties because that was the point that lead paint was outlawed and could no longer be used and so when we're looking at a house that's older than that um, unless it's been repainted recently 
then you know we're going to take that in consideration. Uh, whereas a newer house um, that doesn't come into account. Uh, the other thing that we'll talk about a little bit later is underground plumbing, and um, I don't have a key date on that. Uh, you know, uh, have any input on that on when that might have started changing? I know when we start getting into our 40s, 50s. I guess even 60s houses, a lot of times you'll find cast iron. I think that started transitioning around the 70s as well. Yeah, so Kelly's confirming that. Um, the other thing is, is we want to look at the market area of the property. Um, because, you know, obviously if we're looking at a lower end property, when we start looking at the quality of the flooring, quality of paint, what we're going to use, and we're talking about these factors, you know, a lower end, lower price property, we're going to be more towards the lower end of these factors, whereas a higher end, higher price property obviously is going to push us up. Something that's a good uh, example is flooring. I mean, if we're going to go in and it's a lower end house, we're probably only looking at a few dollars a foot on flooring, whereas we can get up to six, seven, eight dollars a foot on flooring on higher end houses. So all of these things, when we get in here to these factors and to these kind of, you know, how do we go out? and quickly walk a house, look at it, or look at the pictures online, and come up with a ballpark estimate. And that's what we're wanting to do. We're wanting to come up, because this is a step process. You know, you learn about a property. Uh, you do some quick first evaluations of the property to look and see, is this even something worth pursuing? You go out to the property, and you know, a lot of times in these distressed properties, whether it's a foreclosure and we have a short time to work with, or it's through another sailor, uh, another wholesaler that's obviously putting out the bid, uh, speed is key. Speed is key in order to do this and decide is this something we want to pursue. So, applying the factors. What are the factors? Uh, I'm going to give you all some reference material a little bit later in the webinar, but uh, these are factors that if you go out and talk to anyone, and, and these are more specific to Houston, because obviously if you're starting, if you're you wanting to do this outside of, say, Houston or Texas, these are going to be different, but the theory still applies the same, is what do we look at when we start looking at rehabbing these houses? Um, I would give a good example is, is that I would not apply these factors in California because you can have higher or, or other states that might have more demand and higher uh, cost, uh, but you can obviously adjust the concepts accordingly. So the first one is just the basic factor for interior painting and flooring. And this is kind of the low end that we would use but you know if you gotta this is really gonna be when you're looking at cosmetic type things I mean if you get a house that's cosmetic uh, we're looking at a low end of five dollars to six fifty a foot um, give you a little bit of basis for that you know flooring if you think about flooring is gonna cost you a couple of dollars a foot uh, paintings gonna cost you a couple of dollar a couple of dollars a foot that's a pretty basic type house and then you have a little bit that you need to put in there for you know some of your other items like uh, um, like cleanup and things of that. Um, you know, five to six fifty a foot can kind of cover that. But that's going to be most of the properties we're looking at aren't going to be in this range. But unless it's a rental, but you know, five to six fifty a foot is a pretty quick analysis. So it's pretty easy. I mean, if you have uh, say a thousand square foot small house. It doesn't need a lot of work. Looking at 5000 to 6500 to do it. So now we'll talk about thing come into play on top of that. But I mean, if we walk a house and we don't see any major issues and it's not paint and carpet, you know, that's a pretty good range. And then you just start multiplying it. If it's a two-story house and you don't have any significant issues there, then we'd be looking at, you know, 10000 to twelve five. And that's something we do. I mean, that's something as you learn to look at these houses, you can look real quick and say, you know what, this is a pretty good ballpark of where we're at. The next fact is more common of what we see is going to be in the eight ten dollar foot range. And not to say that we don't see some on the other end. Most of the time, if we're looking at distressed houses, um, 
they're going to need a little bit more of the basics most likely because if they're in that 5 to 650 range unless it's a um, a foreclosure that's been well maintained uh, they're probably going to need a little bit more work on them probably going to need some exterior work or repairs maybe some sheetrock and other stuff uh, so you know that's when we go in like again you go in a ballpark and you have a house and it hasn't been as well cared for it's not something that's uh, let's say rent ready or livable then you're looking at eight to ten dollars a foot next we start getting into something that needs a little more work maybe it needs some electrical work or we see it needs some plumbing work uh, looking at the wet areas the wet areas being your kitchens your bathrooms um, utility rooms and stuff like that uh, we start putting a few more dollars in there and that's kind of the baseline where we start we start looking at that and saying you know what uh, we need to put a couple of dollars more a foot into that in order to repair this house and that gives us a ballpark and why does this matter um, we'll get sent a house uh, I'll give you a good example we get sent a house and let's say it's let's just use the easy factors around a thousand square feet and you know first thing they say is well it doesn't need a lot of repairs and and they tell us you know this thing can be fixed up for eight thousand dollars well, we start looking at the pictures and we notice that you know it's got bad stops on the plumbing it needs toilets repaired uh, you know we start seeing some other issues well we already know that they're probably low on their numbers and that's something we see pretty commonly you know now that doesn't mean it's not a deal because we still got to take our other factors we talk about with comps and area and stuff like that but you know when we get someone else's whole number and they send us a whole number and say okay this is what we think the repairs should be and we either by walking the property or looking at pictures say you know what we we're not buying that we think it's going to need more without even going too in depth just kind of getting a visual of it um, that's where that comes into play and so we start getting into you know it's it's a little more than you know some paint and touch-ups and stuff like that we're starting to see it's going to need some pretty other significant either updates or repairs we start moving up to the 12 to 15 dollar range next one is, is seeing some really major stuff and I understand that's a broad scale but at least it's giving you a ballpark deal then we start saying 18 to 25 dollars a foot uh, this would be more in line of what we start on the low end to high end when we start looking at you know pretty significant flips um, yeah and the thing is is you do look at that with some, some base costs but um, you know if we start seeing some pretty extensive stuff and we got one more factor we'll talk about here in a minute um, we start looking at 18 to 25 dollars a foot I mean like <clears throat> like I said we haven't gone in and talked about some of the specifics we're gonna get into but at least to get our range of where we think this is gonna lie and then start applying some of these other concepts to it we're like we know we're going to be in the ballpark of about that much to do it just because the repairs will add up to that much and honestly when we start getting above ten dollars or so a foot we definitely want to get in and start applying some more specific ideas but it doesn't take that much longer to get to that of some of our major components foundation roof AC plumbing um, my missing a factor there electrical I'm sorry electrical uh, and then you know if you start looking at some exterior issues like fencing uh, landscaping cleanup and things of that nature our last one is twenty five thirty dollars a foot now if, if you get in and you're spending more than that then we have to start saying is it reasonable to even do this and I'll talk about why that matters here in a minute but if you're looking at a full remediation major rehab you're going to be in about 25 to 30 dollars a foot and so what do I mean by um, by full remediation major rehab that means we're replacing all of the AC we're replacing all the electrical all the plumbing a lot of times when we've seen full remediations either we have to or it's already been done where sheetrock has been stripped 
you know, from floor to ceiling, you know. I'm sorry? Yeah, down to the studs. That's a good point because that'll tie into what I'm about to say. So it's down to the foundation, the studs, the brick, and that's about it because you're talking about replacing everything else. Uh, where we will waive in that is, is that we've gone into houses before that we know we're going to have to do a full remediation, but it's still got all the junk in there. Uh, we've walked into houses before, um, and actually this came up in Meyerland after the flood. Uh, there were some, some owners that decided not to keep their property, but they had already had someone come in for whatever purposes and remediate and basically strip all that out of uh, the one house I'm thinking of in particular. They had stripped pretty much everything but the electrical. Um, which brings up a good point when you start talking about uh, permits and inspections and stuff like that, uh, especially when, when you're within city areas. If the plumbing's all there and it's um, you know pipe or you know it's it's not uh, PEX or PVC, and all your walls are exposed, you're not going to get away with just fixing what's exposed because that inspector can see that and they're not going to approve that. There are situations where you get in and you're only doing a certain area and that's what you're permitting for. So therefore, they're not looking at the rest of the house. If, as long as that's functional mechanical, then you might have to not incur that cost. But um, when you're looking at a full remediation, you know, you're looking at a lot of cost. Um, and the thing that we always want to do when we're doing any of these is add a 10 to 15% contingency to cover any extras that we might, might have missed. Um, and that's just like I said, we're trying to do a quick, so you know, if we think it's going to be $10,000, we might decide it's going to be ten to $12,000, 10000 to eleven fifty. You know, if we're being conservative and saying using the conservative factor, but we're like, ah, there might be some things out there we're not thinking of, then we might go a little bit uh, higher on uh, putting a 15% contingency. And like I said, this, is, this isn't going out and getting all your estimates, all your bids, or anything like this. This is how do we get in and evaluate a deal quickly so we can make a go or no go decision to proceed and then even, you know, tighten it up after that. How do we make a no go or no go decision while we're looking at our comps and looking at some other factors that come about to decide where we're going to buy this property? At the end of the day, and I'll use a question that we've been asked at different times is when are we for sure about anything? We are for sure when we write the check and when we cash the check. So we're for sure what it's actually going to cost to fix that plumbing or to do that roof or whatever it is when we write the check. And we're for sure about how much money we're going to make when we cash the check. So that's the only time to be for sure. Before I move off the factors and especially talk about the $25 to $30 range, um, Going back, this is city of Houston, but for comparative purposes, and when you look at whether it's worth rehabbing a house and the value that you can get out of that on the comps versus building new, excluding your dirt, excluding your dirt meaning excluding the cost of your lot or anything like that, new construction in Houston will run you anywhere from $60 to $80 a foot for just, say, basic houses and I would say you know we're talking about houses that cost anything from a hundred thousand say starting to get into your you know three fifty four hundred thousand dollar houses and then we'll push upwards to around a hundred dollars a foot uh, when you start really get into some higher end finishes and stuff like that so you know when you look at a house and let's say it's on a lower end and you could replace that property, concrete and all, concrete brick studs and all, for $60 a foot, and a new property is going to comp higher than a rehab property, I mean, is it worth the risk? Is it worth the time and effort and stuff like that? And we run into that where people have a house, you know, you could have two houses sitting next door to each other and say a transitional neighborhood or something like that, and especially when you start looking at high lot values, and, you know, if it's going to start costing you over $30 a foot or, or in that range to replace that and you can get, say, double the price or one and a half times the price,
by tearing that down and building new, um, there's more profit in that, and it doesn't make it doesn't make as much sense. I mean, because when someone walks in, they can buy a rehab or a new, and you find this like in your Meyerlands, your Bel Airs, you know, even your, you know, in these other areas, Spring Branches, stuff like that. That's transitional. Um, obviously, there might be two different people on the market, you know, for one versus the other. But I mean, what what do people prefer between rehabbed and new? They, you know, what do you prefer? If, could you, if you had a used car or a new car, what would you prefer to get? You prefer to get a new car, and all the stuff that comes with that. So let's just work on an example real quickly. Um, say we got a 1,250 square foot house. We're in the 250 to 350,000 price range, so that's kind of one of our transitional areas because that's pretty small for that price. But that's a pretty good example of what you might see for a rehab. On minimum, which said, normally this isn't going to be a property that's in our market as an investor. You know, just to get that house cleaned up and and repainted and stuff like that, you're looking at you know somewhere eight six to eight thousand dollars. You take it to the next level, and more likely what we would be looking at, you know, if you're going to have exterior paint and some repairs and stuff like that. Now, I'm not talking about roof or foundation or anything. You're probably talking about $10,000 to $12,500. You start looking at roof and major mechanicals, using our factors from below, we're probably about $22,500 to $25,000. Take it to the next level, a full rehab. It's probably going to run you 30, 31,000 or so to 37,500. Now, adding the contingency, and I don't have any pictures for this house. We're using an example. I would probably, to be conservative, think that we're probably looking under 50, but maybe 40 to 50 thousand dollars. Especially when you start talking about a full rehab and putting in contingencies for, you know, things that you're missing. Um, if you start looking at adding square footage or higher end finishes then we could be even talking about more so like i said these are these are general concepts and things to look at but you know when we have someone that brings us a 12 square foot house that supposedly will resell for 275,000 and they go and you look at the pictures and it's got a lot of work on it and they go oh well you can rehab this for $20,000 we already kind of know that we're not talking about the same same thing I mean and and you'll see that because they'll come in and I mean they want to sell to me they're going to tell you that they will probably sell for 300 and you only have to put 20 in it and we know that if we only put about you know 20 or so we're probably only going to get around 250 and there's there's a uh, I know you guys can't see it on the screen but there's kind of a, a correlation there too you can't go in and this is what we'll see a lot of times you know there is ranges on these rehabs but you can't go in and take the low low range rehab estimate and expect to get the high end comp and that's what you'll find a lot of times your wholesalers or other people will do uh, not all of them but some of them will do is they go in and they say okay what's the best this will comp for we'll use that as the comp what's the cheapest we can rehab it for we'll use that as the rehab and you can't do that there's there's a direct correlation um, a good example would be especially in a subdivision and I've seen this before a lot of times is that you know you look at for mica tops versus uh, hate to use granite because granite's gotten so expensive but you know you use two different countertops or you use stainless steel appliances versus you know painted appliances uh, you know you can't go in there and you base your estimate on doing the lower end stuff when and get the higher end price and you'll see that in some subdivisions you know they put in wood floors versus carpet or they put in um, your uh, I can't think of the other kind what's the the, the fake wood floors now I'm losing um, yeah engineer wood floors versus real wood floors or you put in vinyl plank versus you know or, or you look at grades of carpet so we have to take that because that's where our ranges come in too is what quality what level we're using and you know that's what you'll see is it's like hey you can get this top comp but you can do the cheap rehab and you can't do that um, 
you know, same thing when you're looking at rental repairs, which are going to be on your lower end of your range versus um, flip repairs. I mean, on flip repairs, you know, if it's a question, most of the time you're going to have to fix it and change it. If it's a rent, then sometimes you can get away with not, you know, changing something out. Roof is a good example. If the roof is structurally sound and looks good, um, you know, on a rent, we're not going to go in there and replace it. If it's a flip, unless that roof is just pristine, we're probably going to have to replace it. So we have to look at that when we're doing our ranges. Um, like I said, the above are base factors, base numbers that we use, but we don't want to forget our contingency factors. So let's talk about testing our estimates. The big ticket items that people miss, and this is really critical, so you get in there and you get your range and you're starting to work with that and you're trying to, like I said, this is something you're trying to get done in 30 minutes or so or, or you know, 45 minutes. Um, the things that people miss. Number one, foundation, roof, and major mechanicals. You really want to make sure you look at your roof lines, you look at your foundation, and you look at your ma major mechanicals. And I know we've done a separate training series that talked about taking your pictures, especially if you're out there looking at several houses. Don't forget to take pictures of this because you're not going to remember and your notes are not going to help you when you go back in and let go, wait a minute, was that roof a little okay or was it not a little, you know, a lot not okay? So, you know, make sure you get that picture taken or you have good pictures of that so you can really look at that because when we start talking about what do these things price, that's a big miss, and people people will miss it or forget to check it. Kitchen appliances and cabinets, same thing. Uh, a lot of times this is going to apply more to um, rental properties versus rehabs. Uh, toilets and appliances and some other things like that, you know, personal use type stuff uh, on a flip. Most of the time, we're going to want to estimate, say, and that puts us in that you know higher range that we want to replace those items. Um, even on rentals, you know, a lot of times we're going to want to replace the toilets. Uh, definitely on flips, and so we want to make sure that you know we didn't use a lower end factor that doesn't take in those wet areas on a house that we know we're going to have to replace those appliances on. A bathroom remodel, um, you start getting into that when you start talking about tile and tubs and stuff like that. Uh, that can be a big item that people will miss. Now your factors take this into account, but like I said, these are going back and testing it. Did I, you know, what air, what what range and what area within the range I use to do that? You know, if it's, if it's still got pretty significant work that needs to be done, but... Um, you know, but it doesn't need a lot of remodel, then maybe we're at the lower end of that range. But if we remember that, you know, it's pretty ugly tile and we know we're going to have to install that stuff, we want to be in the upper end of that range. Doors and windows, uh, especially when you start talking about exterior doors and exterior windows, or excuse me, windows are exterior, but when you start talking about windows, sheet rock damage or replacement. Um, this comes into, and we'll talk about some ways that you can kind of, you know, your contingencies in there, but you can kind of pad your, your numbers. Um, but obviously, you know, just repainting a house and then when you start talking about having to do sheetrock repair, that's going to add some money. It might not be more than a few hundred dollars or maybe a couple of thousand dollars. But, you know, if you're working, when you start looking at your lower end number and you're talking about, you know, thinking your rehab's going to cost you eight to ten thousand, you miss it by two thousand dollars. That's a twenty percent miss. If you got a major rehab and it's going to be fifty thousand dollars, you should be covered by your contingency. But if you miss a couple thousand, you should have cushion in there to take care of that. Exterior fencing and landscape. Want we'll to make sure that we cover that, and uh, that's kind of a list of our. Our major stuff and so what do we do with that you know can we how do we use our range and then adjust for that so we want to look in and see where do we think this is and then 
what we can do sometimes, and foundations one we'll talk about specifically and how that affects other things, but let's say we have a house that doesn't really need significant repairs but cosmetic. Electrical's good, plumbing's good, roof is good, foundation's good, but the AC's shot. Well, we're going to talk about that. So maybe we go in and say, okay, we know that it's going to cost us eight to ten thousand dollars, but it needs a new AC system. It's kind of well, if it's going to need a new AC system, and I'll get to the number in a minute. We'll probably say, well, we probably ought to push that number around thirteen to fifteen thousand. So you know, we're we're kind of building here through a very quick process of looking at it, getting us in a range, and then making sure we take these major things into account. So let's talk about adjusting for the big ticket items. Here's some quick calculators you guys can use. A foundation report is going to run you about $270 to $450. The variation is, is that you don't have to have an engineering report to give you an idea of what needs to be done on the foundation. None of us like to spend money that we don't have to spend. But here's the thing. If we look at a house and we say, you know what, we think this is probably a potential deal, then we'll have our engineer come out and give us a report that's not a certified engineered stamp report that says, here's what we think needs to be done in lieu of foundation, uh, in, in, in regards to foundation repair. And really what we're looking for in that report is, how many piers or how many, how many foundation piers are going to need to be done and how many are interior versus exterior. Now, the alternative is we can get our foundation repair company to come out there and do that for us pretty quickly, but you know, that's a demand issue. When we're talking about we need something pretty quick and you talk about paying someone versus waiting for someone to come give you a bid, there's two things. One is if you're paying someone, they're probably going to come out there and do it faster. The second is is that even with our foundation repair companies, they've always usually been on the high side versus the low side when it talks about you know number of peers that need to be done. And so the 275 is not a bad uh, price to pay to keep you from obviously making when we talk about you know issues that could be thousands of dollars in there. Um, at the end of the day, if it is going to need a foundation repair, it's going to be about a total of 450 dollars. And at the end of your foundation repair, you do want to get a uh, engineer's report in conjunction or in addition to the warranty you'll get from your foundation company. So we get that report. In the investor world, what we're normally paying is $150 to $180 per peer. Uh, it can be a little bit higher if you're talking about interior peers. A lot of times, uh, most of the time, we are hoping for and we can get with exterior peers and that's what's going to run. Now, a foundation a property, it has foundation issues, especially to the to the a significant amount that you can't look at and say it's not going to take a lot. It's pretty, pretty uh, minimal. Um, you know, we're going to want to know what that number is and we're going to want to take the time to get that number, figure, you know, figured out for us. Um, before I go to the next one, though, here's what we got to remember to consider. If we look at a house and we're saying the way it looks right now, it just needs some paint and sheetrock work, but we know that it's got foundation issues, that automatically is going to kick us up to the higher end of our factor for some sheetrock repair and stuff like that, because when you move a house and adjust it for foundation repair, you're going to have cracks and other stuff to your sheetrock and you're looking at not just paint but needing to add some money in there for your sheetrock repairs. It's just inevitable. I haven't seen a house yet. Kelly, I don't know if you have, but I've I dealt with a lot of foundation repair when we did uh, work in Bel Air and then on houses that I've done myself and then we've done it as a company. And when you adjust the foundation, you are going to have sheetrock damage, door da you know, door adjustments and stuff like that. So you are looking at your higher end when you talk about that side of your uh, estimate. 
The next is roof replacement. Roof replacement in the investor world here in Houston runs about $165 to $185 per square. Uh, we'll talk about uh, here in a minute because we're going to talk about roofs in particular, uh, what affects that factor, and primarily what affects that factor is going to be pitch. But we got a whole section we're going to talk about on estimating your roof. Same thing though. We go in and let's say we got a house. It doesn't fall in our higher range because our mechanicals are good. We know we can, you know, retain the AC units and things of that nature, but we do need to have a roof. Well, same thing. This is kind of a building process. You know, we gotta we gotta we can't sit there and take any of these things independently. We kind of build upon them, but we can work really quickly to get there. Uh, so going back to like what I said, if if you know we think the repair is going to be around ten thousand dollars, but we're going to have to add a roof. Well, we don't have to jump up into that higher factor because that covers a lot more things than roof, but we can add our roof to it and get us in the ballpark. AC system repair um, that is on the high end. Normally we can be in you know five hundred thousand, fifteen hundred, but if you're looking at replace, you know most of the AC is is good but you're replacing a main component or a couple of main components it's going to run you about two thousand five hundred dollars um and full well that's what i got into that's a good question the question was is how does that compare to a full replacement and um uh and that is uh, that's where we get into next, and and you got to think that that's per most. A lot of times you're only talking about sink system, uh, multiple systems. You got to go in more, but you're looking at about forty five five thousand dollars per system, and that's talking about duct work, the furnace, uh, the um, your uh, your air handler, your condenser unit, and everything like that. Um, so. You know, if you're able to keep the AC system and clean it up and everything, I mean, that a lot of times can be done for minus a thousand dollars. If you have everything's good, but let's say you had to replace one major commit, then you're probably talking about a couple thousand dollars. Honestly, when you start running into more than that, it's usually better to go ahead and replace the whole system. But you're looking at about forty-five hundred to five thousand uh, dollars per system. Electrical re rewiring. Looking at about three to four dollars a square foot. Plumbing hydrostatic. Oh, just a moment. I think I lost our screen. Rob, can you still see the screen? Apologize. The yeah, the screen's still off there, Stacy. You did lose the screen. Yeah, I'm looking at the last one. No, I have the okay, screen. one second. line says plumbing hydrostatic, 450. Um, and so you see the next one where it says plumbing water heaters? Did no, that come up? Not up yet. One moment. I think my, no. my uh, okay, well, let me, it looks like something locked. Let me um, bear with me for just a moment. Let's see if we can't. Get that to come back up for us. Be nice one day when technology is perfect. <laughs> I know we have we have sometimes we think that technology is is made a lot of advances, but uh, when we still have things like this happen, we know it hasn't. Let me start this over from scratch. All right, one second. Okay, screen area. Let's see if I can.
Okay, you got the screen back now? Yes. Very good. Okay, we'll keep on going. So plumbing hydrostatic. Um, why would we want to run a hydrostatic report? Well, we're going to get in the cost here in a minute, but if we have an older property or and a property that has cast iron sewer lines, we quite possibly are going to want to run a plumbing hydrostatic. Um, but on the other hand, we might not. Uh, honestly, uh, there's two things that have come about with that. One is is that um, when we, t well, guys, it has. Uh, no, I don't think I don't think I've been hacked. But for some reason, it has. Um, it has dropped the screen again. This time I just mine said did it had... drop, Stacy. <laughs> yeah, apologize. It just said had a connect. Yeah, it said had a connection problem. Oh, yeah. I'm not quite sure why it's giving us a hard time. I'll tell you what, we will do it this way. We're getting into the good stuff, and then the screen decides it wants to fight with us. OK. So if I can get, I'm in the corner there. All right, you should have a screen again. Can you confirm that for me, Rob? Yes, and I can see your cursor. OK, very good. OK, going back to plumbing hydrostatic. Um, if it's questionable, we want to get, we probably want to get it done. Uh, what we have run into, though, and this started kind of out in Baytown and some other areas, is that uh, if, if we're in a permitted area, um, what we have seen is is that they are requiring these underground sewer lines to be replaced. So we're almost by default budgeting in at least if a, as a contingency, if not as an absolute, that we're going to have to redo this underground plumbing. Uh, the other thing that comes up, which we talked about in our training series on that Kelly did uh, for us a while back about trek contracts, is that the new Texas Real Estate Commission contract that we recommend using has in there that you cannot perform a hydrostatic without the seller's written consent. And I don't have that in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that's accurately, and Kelly's given me the confirmation. So uh, first of all, you might not get the permission to do it. <laughs> Uh, and when you do it, it's probably going to tell you what you already know, which is that the uh, underground plumbing needs to be replaced. The other is, is when we talk about permitted areas, um, you know, what we started seeing, I think, uh, let's see, last year in 2015, is that um, more and more they were leaning towards uh, replacing that plumbing. So what does that get us into? Um, actually, I'm going, I guess, lowest to highest. Uh, just for some basics, uh, if, if uh, you've got a house and a lot of times this falls in a row, or, or but even the flips, uh, if you need to replace a water heater, you know, depending on where it's gas or electric, you're looking at about a thousand to twelve hundred fifty dollars. Um, same thing, you might have all your plumbing's good, all your other stuff is good, but you know, if that water heater is old, uh, we're going to recommend replacing it. So. You know, same thing, we get back to the basics, you know, it needs a basic rehab and say around the $10,000 range, but we got a couple water heaters, we're going to add a couple of thousand to it. If we get into significant plumbing, complete redo, um, especially when you start talking about your pecs and stuff, we're talking about $350 to $4, maybe a little more uh, if you decide to do, um, and I know we talked about in our plumbing training, 
uh, you start talking about manifolds and that that type of stuff. Um, the underground, though, the underground is where you have a significant cost number and being conservative on what I've seen, it's going to be about 5,000 minimum uh, to even 6,500 plus. And that's going to cover your normal foundations, say up to a couple of thousand square feet. If you're a huge, large house or you're talking about um, maybe some other issues with trees and stuff, uh, you could be looking at more than that, you know, even maybe upwards of $8,000. Um, um, here's the thing, though, that and your rehab, that's a big miss. Um, and when you're out looking at plumbers quoting and stuff like that, and plumbers have probably become or one of the hardest and most difficult to find good ones and to keep them on the job. But um, when they go into quote, a lot of times, unless you ask them specifically, they're not quoting the underground. They're co quoting everything that's within the studs and up in the roof. Uh, we ran into that with a client that uh, felt like that our a quote we had given one time was inaccurate. And when we got into the details of the quote, this house was absolutely a candidate for underground plumbing, and that was not included in that. So that that can be a um, a big miss. Fencing, not that hard, but obviously don't forget it because when you're talking about 1650 to 2250 per linear foot, depending on you know what style of fence and and uh, whether it's going to have rock boards and stuff like that. I mean, um, you know, a few hundred feet up to a thousand feet of fence uh, that could be you know something to miss, or that's obviously something you want to adjust for. So, like I said, this is kind of a combination thing. It's you know things we want to adjust for, things we certainly don't want to miss. And here here are some really good factors you can use. Calculating roof squares. So that is something that uh, is not that difficult, but obviously a mystery because everybody is. What's a roof square? <laughs> what is a square of, of a roof? So one square equals a hundred square foot of roof. Now, remember our roof is flat, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But that is what a roof square is. It's a hundred square foot of roof. We want to adjust for the pitch of our roof. So to give you an example, a low pitch thousand square foot house, and I'm talking about a one story, we'll talk about two stories in a minute, but let's say we just have a square thousand square foot house. Our factor though on our square footage is going to run 1.2 on the low end up to 1.4 on the high end for a low slope versus medium slope roof. And so we have to account for that. So just like I said, a thousand square foot house is going to have about 1,200 square foot of roof space because when you pitch it, it's adding square footage because it's not flat. What is your slope? Your slope is basically your rise over 12 inches. And I know for you guys that aren't watching, but basically if you take a ruler and you lay it on a flat table and you have a ruler or tape measure at one end of it, leaving one end flat and raise it up, if you raise it up three inches over 12 foot, which isn't a lot of, I mean, excuse me, three inches over 12 inches, which isn't a lot of, you know, steepness to it, that's considered a low slope roof. A lot of our roofs are going to be more of what's considered a medium slope, which is going to be more of six to nine inches over 12 inches. And then when you get into some of your fancier houses or your two stories, you get actually into more of a high pitch roof, which is going to be nine inches or more over 12 inches. And the reason we want to have those factors in there for the squares is because uh, obviously our expense goes up and when we were looking at our factor earlier you know a higher pitch roof is going to have more squares and it's going to cost us more than a lower pitch roof and if you think about it yourself if you're up on a roof that's fairly flat you know three to six inches you can almost walk that and so it's a different 
you know, it's it's a different risk factor for them. When you start talking about nine nine inches or more over 12 inches, that gets pretty steep. You have scaffolding and other stuff that come into play. So let's do a quick estimate. Or how do you, you do a quick estimate? Sorry. Sorry. If it's one story, you've got to take the square foot of the house, divide by 100, equals the number number of squares times your 1.2 talk and we have adding in for that if it's a two story now the simple factor um honest if it starts it's getting a little thousand square foot house that's pretty square and you want, might want to do some elements and things like that, and there's some ways to do that that if uh, we don't have time, but uh, there's two ways to do that if you want to start looking at a funny shaped roof house and um, figure out what the squares are. The free way to do it yourself, to, um, I believe it's Google Earth is where I've done it before, and you can go down on top of a house and you can draw a map on top of the house and it will tell you how many square feet it is. And I've done that before where I've, you know, you find the property address and you go in there and it's it's like a, uh, it's just like a little map draw. And so you can outline that roof and when you outline that on that uh, Earth, if it's not Google Earth, it's one of their products, but I'm pretty sure that's and I have it saved in there, um, it'll tell you how many square feet. To give you an interesting thing, I think I know one of the ones I did it was my own house because I wanted to do a comparative. The other way that you can get roof roofs calculated for you exactly, and it does cost a little money, is a program or a company called Eagle View. And honestly, Eagle View, and you can do that as a retail customer, is Eagle View is what's used by a lot of your roofing companies to get that and that's what they use for their bids and they have uh, what do you call it uh, subscriptions and stuff like that but Eagle View will give you a bid on your roof and how many squares and that's a paid service but like I said on my house which has a really kind of a funky design to it because it's on a cul-de-sac on the roof I actually measured it myself and then I also paid for the Eagle View to get an estimate for a roofer rather than them doing it and it was pretty pretty tight about being the same. Now, you know, I've done some with other houses where there's some trees and stuff you got estimate, but you know, it doesn't take you that long. And that's something that like I said, if if you can't if it's not just a square box and the roof is a little bit different, then you might want to use one of those to get your number of squares. That's true. Yeah, the, the Kelly just had a good point that you can go to your county appraisal district and sometimes they'll have that information for you as well to get that. And Hillary, you had a question? Divided by or in front of. So take the square footage of the house divided by two and then you divide that number by 100. It's a parenthesis. So, no, no, no. There is. Here, let me see if I can get my my. Uh, yeah, see, there's a open there's open parentheses there and close parentheses there. So, the reason why is that actually it does kind of work. But I wanted to have in here. You want to take this and divide by two, and then divide that number by a hundred. It, it's just a way of of stating the formula there. Um, but like I said, the point is is that uh, on a on a box on a lot is what we called it a new home building. Yeah, you know, basically you've got four brick walls and they're all pretty much the same. And you know you you've got you know it's not like your one and a halfs or something like that. You just got a double decked house. And if it's a two thousand square foot house, well your roof is only going to be calculated on half of that. So you would divide it by two and then multiply for your slope and everything. Um, uh, the roof pitch. 
some of that, there's other construction concepts when you start talking about going up versus wide. But obviously, if you have a 2,000 square foot one story house, then you do have 2,000 square foot of roof coverage times your slope factor. So that's why we do on a two story. And like I said, if it gets, you know, it takes you a little bit more time, but not that much. Um, if uh, if uh, it's a funny shape roof or you're having some problems, you can either go to Eagle View and you can get something back from them pretty quick, or you can go to, uh, you know, the Google product, and um, which is free, and get pretty close on calculating your square foot yourself. Um, like I said, we want to add, you know, usually, you know, take the factor, we add you a couple squares just to be um, safe. And then what we want to do is a few squares for contingency, you know, two to three, four squares. You know, so if you come out and it's, you know, you do your, and it's like, you know, uh, hundred, um, let's say it's uh, 102 squares. Well, round it up to 105, you know, something like that. Uh, the other thing you want to do, and this is when you're looking inside the attic or maybe looking inside the garage or something like that, is that um, we always want to add a couple of sheets for decking because usually they're going to find a decking as your plywood that's on top of your rafters that your roof is, uh, has been uh, nailed into. Um, but if you start seeing a lot of rotted decking, which are your 8x4 uh, plywood sheets, uh, most roofers charge about $27 to $30 per sheet for decking to be replaced. Um, normally, you're going to throw in, and roofers will are going to throw in and say, okay, this includes you know, a couple of sheets of decking anyway. Uh, but like I said, if you got into a roof that either, let's say it was over shake shingles, so you know you're going to have to redeck the whole thing, or you see a lot of rotted decking in there, then you're going to want to, you know, it's, it's one thing to add a couple of sheets if you start talking about adding you know, 10, 15, 20 sheets of decking, then you want to account for that accordingly. Um, I'm not I, I'm not going to go to Q&A right yet. There was something that I wanted to show you guys, and, and this kind of gets into what we like to tra train you, and uh, I know we're running a few minutes behind, but um, let me open a Google thing. Uh, this is someone I know personally, and we'll bring this over here. Um, and uh, oh, second, I'm gonna pull it back to me real quick so I can get on where I want to be. Uh, let's see, history. Okay, let me get this all set up right. We've recommended to you guys before, and I'm, I gotta get where I can see this, a um, a book called by a guy here in Houston named Brant Phillips, someone that we know. And uh, actually, there's a little video on there, and he's he's a local Houston guy that we've done stuff with, and his name his company's called Invest Home Pro. Um, but he has a book that talks about the same things. These, these aren't secrets. These concepts and these factors and doing this, these aren't secrets. These are things that people we know and network in the business use the same thing. It's like, what makes the difference between y'all and, and, and people that are trying to get into it? Well, they're not really secrets. We just know what they are, formulas and stuff. But he has a book. I think it's called Seven steps to a flip or something that's very good that we have in our recommended reading but I was going back to look at something and I saw an email for him about his free rehab estimator and I've always we've always been kind of cautious of those because you know you start messing with the factors and the detail and stuff like that and uh, you know it can throw you off but I'll check it out and see where he's gone with that um, and if you go to, I think it is freerehabestimator.com, what I like that Brant had done is, is that when I looked at this and I was going back and looking at what we use in our own business, his numbers are pretty good. Now, this isn't always the shortest way, and just like we have another, uh, I think it's Eddie G's, Eddie Gant, one of our partners, uh, rehab estimators, um, 
it looks like he's keeping these numbers up to date. And so when I was going through and I said, oh, that's pretty cool, something we could share with our our students and started looking at some of his numbers, I was like, wow, that's pretty close to or, or right on what we use. One thing that got my attention real quick because I was looking at major numbers were, you know, we say 165 to 185, he says 162 to 186. Well, that's not going to throw you off, but what I liked about it is, is it's investor numbers, not um, not remodel numbers, and that's something that on the opposite way throws new uh, um, new investors off and can keep them from buying good deals. Is that you know we use investor uh, focused, sometimes the word is friendly uh, construction people on our trade, and. To give you an example, if any of you here in Houston or even around have uh, Texas have replaced your roof, you know if you get one of these retail commercial roofing companies to quote your roof, they'll quote you anywhere from 350 to 425 a square. And if you're using numbers like that to do your estimates on your rehab, then you're going to overprice your rehab or overspend, especially if you use them, and you're going to miss out on a good deal or making profit. But um, I would go check this out. Like, like I said, it's www.freefrehabrehabestimator.com. -E and I uh, actually did a video for Brent one time, and we run into him periodically. But you know, it's a free tool out there. Why not use it? And like I said, what I liked was is that you know, the factors, uh, there's some in there that I would have a little bit of conversation with them on, but I tell you what, for the most part, when I look through a lot of these details, it's numbers that we use in our business, and it's pretty pretty accurate for the market here in Houston. So I'm kind of scrolling through that, and you can see, now you will get on his mailing list, which I understand, I don't blame you, I mean, he's out there to buy and sell houses, but, um, you know, have pretty good, pretty good stuff in here. Pretty good uh, um, tool that you can use. But here's the thing: like any tool, and you notice these blanks in here. You know, when you start getting that level of detail to build your rehab, don't want to throw yourself off or use, uh, you know, use bad numbers. Um, I'm gonna go back over here real quick, and we'll, if I can find my place on my computer. Uh, I don't know how I got off there. Uh, the Q and A, and um, with that, if uh, I'd actually printed that out, uh, if you guys have any questions, um, I know we're running a little bit behind, but certainly hope this was helpful. Yes, go ahead. Full of mildew. Well, let me let, let me repeat the question real quick. So the question is, um, do we ever just look at a house and um, look at the pictures and just say, absolutely, no, we're not going to do that? Um, you know, that in and of itself, no, because it all comes back to the numbers. Now, if we look at a house and someone's told us, this is what we think it can sell for, and this is what we want for it, and it just doesn't make sense, then yeah, we will pass on it, and we see that all the time. So I think the thing is, is, is not that we pass on it just because it takes a lot of rehab or not a lot of rehab. That's just one component on, can we buy it for the right price, put the money we think that should be put into it, regardless of what they say it is, put the money we think that should be put into it, and sell it for the right price to make a profit. That's because honestly, um, and, and there's kind of a, a, a term that I know my mentor and, and, and I've heard others joke about it is, you go into a really nasty house, the term is it smells like money. If you can buy it for the right price, the nastier it is, the more work it needs, 
um, then there's a lot more opportunity there. What turns us off is that if we go in there and the person selling the house is not going to be realistic about either at the end of the day, honestly, what they think the rehab is and what the ARV is doesn't really matter because we're going to do it on ours. But what they want to buy, what they want for the house, and that's where you make your first money. You make the money for what you buy it for. Um, then, you know, that may or may not. But yeah, we pass on, a, I think we do pass on a lot of them, but we pass on them not because of the pictures. It's what they want for it. So um, let me repeat that, Rob. I'll tell you what. Let me, uh, Rob, I'll type this into, I know you got a question about the uh, author. So, uh, Brant Phillips, I can't remember if he's two I's or not, two L's or not. Okay, got it. Hello. 